Uh, Brenda, I, I know you're there listening, so I am going to send you um, an invite as a speaker. Oh, says Brenda can't be invited because you want to speak. Okay, Brenda, let's try that now. <clears throat> Hi. Is this better? Yeah, I don't hear Nico. Okay, so I'm going to have to learn this device and how to deal with it because uh, clearly um, I, I need I need to. So now I think we're better now. So let's 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 let, let's let give everybody a couple of minutes to 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 join us and see uh, who comes on. Um, now you know what has happened, uh, Brenda. You see, Otoa has made a technical mistake, so now I have thrown him out. Now he can't come. Back. <laughs> 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 Let him first send us some needs by DHL and then we'll see what to do about exactly. him. Exactly. <laughs> let, let him first send some choma and we first decide yep. whether we want him back in or not. You know, power is an interesting game. Now I'm in control. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Brenda, I think people are, 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 are logging back on. So let's give them a few minutes to sort of catch up with us. So, sure. first, first of all, let's, let's first figure out. So, Hello, Brenda, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Hello. I'm here. Now I was asking, you know, you know so fa first of all, do you guys still have lockdown where you are? No. Um, so we had lockdown early in the year, Feb February till maybe May. Um, but then, yeah, no, we haven't had lockdown anymore. And I think we're moving more towards a full opening. I think by next, actually on Sunday, we're, we're letting go of the mask mandates outside. So we're, we're mm -hmm. going back to almost normal. Mm -hmm. For us here, yeah. curfew starts at seven. Uh -huh. We're still in those things. Schools are still closed. Uh, masks, PCR tests. Everywhere yeah. you go, you must get a test. Yeah. So life is still in. We are still in 2020, basically. Yeah, I mean the way the way how you, you can't get in anywhere without being vaccinated. So um, I think yeah. yeah, to an extent that has helped because the cases are really really low right now. So we were averaging thousands a day, and now we're down to between twenty and forty a day. Oh, okay, so you guys. Are yeah. Safe. Anyway, let's first leave Tony in the waiting room. Let him first. Be there for <laughs> I see him as he's pressing request, request, but since he was complaining about <laughs> echo, let him be there first. Let him let, let him be in, a, in limbo while we talk. So 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 Brenda, um let's first establish yeah. what is your profession. I'm a lawyer. My profession. Yes. And uh, is that what you're practicing now? Yes, right now I'm practicing. I'm practicing law. Um, my practice focuses around mergers and acquisitions. I do a bit of banking and finance, but when I do banking and finance over the past few years, it's kind of it's kind of um, tended towards aircraft lease and finance, so a bit more asset finance than your usual corporate finance. So I'd say my main practice is mergers and acquisitions. Over over during for some reason during the pandemic, I was doing a bit of venture capital. So that's an area that now that I'm, you know, gaining a bit of interest in. Okay. You know that uh, even me, I am a lawyer, but never to see I know. practice. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yes. So, so, so which, is where, which is where I really first, technically speaking, get to know your family? Because mm -hmm. uh, your dad was my professor uh, at Makere and a really, really dear friend. And we disagreed ideologically, but we remained very, very good friends. I mean, he, he just thought I was wasting time with Marxism. And I thought he was lost in his uh, capitalist world. And so, but, but, but we got along very well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great that, that me and you uh, are good friends and the, the tradition has continued. Absolutely. So I want to take you back. Mm -hmm. so, so, so let's start with school. Where, 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 where was school for you? Where, where, where did you go to school? So, it's, I mean, it's, it was a mixture of things. I was, I, I want to take it maybe a bit further back. I was born in exile yeah, when sure. my parents were in exile in Nairobi. Yes. And yes. when I was two, 
uh, we moved to Canada. And my first experience of school was Canada. My mom, my, my, my dad, as you know him, was a very cantankerous man. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> but yeah. he was... Well, your, uh, your, mom, your, mom, your mom is listening. So okay, then he's listening. Mom. Poor me, I have a lot of explaining <laughs> to do after this. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> so he was very much in student leadership at his time in Makere. And when he finished with Makere, he went into the Benaisa government. So when Obote II came back, he was one of those people who was in and out of jail. And when he had, yes. the, when he had the opportunity, he fled. And my mom followed yes. soon after. And while we okay. were, while, when they were in Nairobi, my she wasn't, was, she, she, was, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't going to let politics get in the way of love. My friend, Emitima, what was that word? What, what? <laughs> Yeah, she had to follow her man's man. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So, in, in so, Kenya, I think after I was born, a couple of um, probably years after I was Obote II had started now hounding the Ugandans who were in Kenya. And because of that, my parents mm -hmm. now had to flee into Canada as refugees. And this was about 1983, okay. 1984. So, my first experience of school mm -hmm. was a little school at Queen's University where my mom was doing her master's degree called Queen's Daycare. I'm, I'm reciting this from mm -hmm. history because obviously I have no recollection, you know. <laughs> and, well, um, as long as it is accurate. Of course. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, yeah, so after that, um, 1987, we moved mm. back to Kenya and I went to a school called Spring Valley Daycare. No, Spring mm. Valley Junior, I think. I don't think it's in existence anymore. Um, that's where mm. I did my... Um, let's say P1 or, or like end nursery to about P3. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in 1992, yeah. we all moved back to Uganda. Um, my dad got mm -hmm. a teaching job at Macquarie University and my mom uh, got a job with the Ministry I, of Education. I, rem I remember him driving into the parking lot at the faculty. With his Pujo. Pujo <laughs> with Kenya number plate. Yes. And it was this tall, big guy walking through the corridor. <laughs> Yeah. And he, he, with his long sleeved shirt folded, and was like, "This guy is going to be a professor." We're like, are you sure? <laughs> so anyway, uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So when we came back to Uganda, I um I went to Kitante Primary School, and then P six moved to Buganda Road Primary School. And the reason for that move is my parents are very big on academics, and they yes. felt that at Buganda Road that we would, me and my sister, would have a bigger chance at getting into good schools for secondary school. So oh, okay. from Buganda, okay. yes. because of grades and yes, it was all about grades. I, um, I, I mean, we'll talk about it later, but yeah, it was all about grades. Yes. And um, after yes. Buganda Road, I went to Namagunga for my O level. Um, I, I, I was kind of bored with Namagunga by S3, so I put my first choice in Gaza. I went to Gaza for, for, for my A level. So I went to Namagunga for O and Gaza. Why were you? Okay. What, what? Why were you bored? <laughs> what, what I were don't you? know. <laughs> It's hard to put it. I, I think a Namagunga girl would get it. The, I, there's just no way to explain it. But I needed a change. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and okay. Um, yeah, so I moved to Gaza for my A level. And from there, I went to Macquarie University. And from Macquarie University, yeah. went to Oxford. Uh, no, sorry, to LDC. So, then so when you go, when you, yeah. So when you go to Macquarie University, what did yes. you study at Macquarie? So I did the Bachelor of Laws. It was a four-year program. Mm -hmm. And okay. for me, my did your dad... dad my, did your dad teach you? Yeah. Thank <laughs> God, no. I think by that time, he was, <laughs> <laughs> he was transitioning out of employment at that point. He was one of those people who said, okay. by, by the time I'm 50, I'm not going to be employed by anybody. So by the time my sister and I joined Macquarie, he, he was sort of on his way out. And um, okay. All right. yes, yes. And then, yeah, so my career, I did so my four-year course. So what was it, if I may just mm. take you back before we, we, we leave the, the... If we go back, if you go back to your secondary school, yeah, was there any indication or was there anything either in your family or your schooling experience that showed you that you were going to pursue a legal career? Ah, this is a very when interesting story. Me, <laughs> so, yes. uh -huh. so when I was, like, younger, let's say maybe seven to... To 11. I really wanted to be a doctor. I was so obsessed hey. with, yes. And then 
one day in P6, I actually remember this very clearly. Uh, my mom picked me from school and we were talking. I was like, so what do you want to become? And I'm like, of course I want to be a doctor. And she's like, really? Wouldn't you want to be a doctor like mm. daddy? <laughs> I mean, a lawyer like daddy? And then I was like, oh, uh-huh. I don't know. But then, you know, his whole life used to fascinate me. As you know, he's larger than life. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he was on and off. Oh, true, true, true. Yeah, <laughs> he was hilarious. Uh, his, his life seemed so... Oh, yeah. um, amazing you know he was on and off planes yes. it just seemed like yeah this this might be something i would want to do in the future so by the mm-hmm. time i got to p7 i had already decided that i wanted to be a lawyer and this did not okay. help me in high school because obviously i, I mean sciences i just <laughs> did them to pass but i had absolutely no interest mm. whatsoever yes mm-hmm. yeah so 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 then in your in your in your secondary education yeah uh, you then select, you know, was there any giveaways as to what you really, you know, this journey was going to end up at the Faculty of Law? I mean, I, I think at the back of my mind, I always knew, and I just had a, I had a, a knack for the humanities. So I was really good in the art mm-hmm. subjects. And, I, and actually, I was not bad in the sciences as well. I just didn't care for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, I, I, okay. and regardless of not caring for them, I still did quite well you know, in the, in the science mm. subjects. It's just I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. And, and I knew that yes. what would get me into law was literature, was commerce, mm. was history, mm. you know. So those were sort of the mm. subjects I really, really, really loved and enjoyed. So you, so you go to the faculty of law in Makere. Yeah. How was that? So before I joined Makere, um, my sister is a year older than me. And um, she mm. had joined a year prior and the day she's also she is so so a day a day before we started um um the the course my dad calls me and he's like brenda there's something i need to tell you and i'm like huh, what now and he's like you know do you use my name you're going to my place of work and i'm going to tell you exactly what i told barbara last year please don't don't ashamed me don't embarrass me <laughs> so I went into law school with this thing of oh my gosh I cannot embarrass this man so because of that because of that yes. cloud hanging I worked so hard I used to read all the time you know I mean I, I had a balance yes. with with um, social life and whatever but really I was really focused on my books and and he sat was, and that you're, that you're, one, of, you're one of those you're one of those who sleep in the cage uh, in the library. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, he, he just said you have to really make your first year count. Like, that's the time to get the best grades. Like, while everybody's partying and whatnot, just do your thing and, and make sure you, you get good grades because later on, you're going to find the subjects are easier and you're going to be able to choose what you want to do. But first year is important. You need to get you need to get your grades straight. I was like, okay. But I didn't really used to use the cage as much because by that time, my dad had established his law school and he had his own library. So I used to go and study there. So I'd finish from a career at four. I never stayed at campus either. Like, talk, yeah. talk, talk about unfair. <laughs> really, <laughs> you use what you have available to you, you know. <laughs> and I guess, kids, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah but kids was frustrating because you'd go, the pages are torn out of the books and yeah. whatnot, and I had a whole library yes. at my disposal. So I would rather go yes. there or I'd go to the LDC library. So, so was there anything in your early life? I mean, the childhood and the family. Were there any? Mm particular things in the family that made you studious, that brought this, developed that, you know, studious approach to, to life, I mean, reading and yeah. so, so you, you said something about no color TV at some point. So yes. do you want to tell us about that? Absolutely. So my parents are both overachievers and, you know, yeah. just, just being born to two people with that set of accomplishments was on its own yes. quite daunting. And there was always this uh-huh. pressure, even if they did like quite so much put the pressure on you, there was always this pressure to to measure up to what they've done or even yeah, try the, and... the, the family the, 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 the family tradition is obvious. So nobody yes. can tell you. Exactly. <laughs> you had to get like you had to mm. do well at school, you had to do well at university, you had to get a second degree. It it went without saying. But then when we were younger, mm. um my parents were very big on reading and they were very big on mm. academics. 
So we had a very, very huge, very vast library. I, I believe now a lot of the books have been donated to Uganda Pentecostal University. But at the time, we had like quite a huge library. And we had a black and white mm. TV because, you know, black and white TV could not get the nice channels with the nice programs, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, true. what you would get was yeah. when we were in Kenya, you, you know, I think it was KBC or, or Kwe, uh, KBC, sorry, Kenya Broad. Is. Yeah, KBC, it was news, that's right? KBC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when we, and when we moved to Uganda, it was UTV. There was a very big emphasis That's on reading. And I loved to read. I started reading at a very early age. I used to initially read like between, between the age of three and I think maybe nine. I used to do a lot of the fiction at that time. I don't know. Nancy Drew, mm-hmm. Hardy Boys, In It Black Horn. In It Black Horn. Yes. <laughs> but by the time I turned 11, I had moved on. I was on Chino Achebe, <laughs> Salmon Rush. Hey. I'd really moved on. You're and, mad. How yes. could you be reading Salmon at 11? Exactly. Wow. And they used to hide the books and I'd find them because my dad would say, you know, and my mom would just be saying, these are not appropriate for your age. And I'd say, okay. And then when they'd leave, I'd still find the books. So by the age of 13, I'd yes. read the entire library. There's no book in the house that I've wow. not read. Okay. Okay. So the now reading that's, that's, that's came that's from an early age, yes. And then the other thing yes. maybe that they did a yes. lot was also to focus on uh, to focus us very much on academics. And for as long as I remember, yes. we always had... Um, how, how, huge... how, 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 how did they do that? What exactly did they do that forced you to focus on, on, on academics? So we had tutors all the time. And I think this was an advantage of my dad being at, uh, at, a, at a university. There were always students who were willing to tutor. Uh, for extra pocket money so we always had tutors yes. during the holidays so between like on holiday okay. you get from yeah your holiday starts on on uh, friday let's say you have saturday sunday to rest and enjoy yourself monday to friday you're going to be having proper classes from nine to five or whatever time it was i can't quite remember and when you but then on the weekends we used to really rest they were big on road trips so we would <laughs> drive to places so it was a balance they were strict yes you had to study but then there was also uh, a realization that there had to be a bit of balance and we had to relax and, and whatnot. And, and the good thing is both of them have a wild sense of humor. So Absolutely. They're, really, really they're party people, people you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes. So, so, so then you finish Makerere. Yeah. And I believe you finished Makerere with a major accomplishment. Do you want to tell us about that? That, you know, that... Because I think all that studying and reading led to yeah. something. Yeah, um, Makere was interesting for me. Um, I think um, after my at, at the end of my first year, I remember there was a class. I think it was administrative law, where I hadn't quite done well. I think I had like a sixty-eight or something, and I got sat down and and um, um, I was told, you know, you can't get these grades. <laughs> Those were the words. Of your Who is friend. telling you this now? Your friend. <laughs> My dad was like, you can't be getting this much embarrassing me. <laughs> and uh, and um, and then also, but we also had like all these young like lecturers who'd been to Cambridge, who'd been to Harvard. And I used to look at them and I'm like, I also want to go to Cambridge or to Harvard. <laughs> so okay. I, I wondered mm-hmm. what they Those did. Those are nice places and to I, go. Exactly. And I think some of them were friendly with my dad and, and you know, he'd say so-and-so went to Cambridge. That person got a very good upper second. Because, you know, those days, for a very long time, these first classes were not heard of. They were far and few in between. So he'd say so-and-so went to Cambridge. So and so. They were like two or three. Yes. Exactly. And I, I just, in my mind, I just said I also have to go to one of those schools. And when I, and at a very early stage, I think I went to one of those internet cafes and looked up what I needed and it said first class. And for me, that was it. I just said I have to get this first class at whatever cost. So I studied and studied and studied. Uh, I, I didn't start off with a first class. I started off with a very good upper second. I think I had a 4.2 GPA and the first class was a 4.4. And because of my bad mm-hmm. grades in the second semester of first year where I had that 68, it kind of pulled me down. I think I had a 4.0 or something, mm-hmm. and then my grade went to 4.1. And then I was told, oh, so you're the, you're the only ones, the first class, then you're here getting 68. You can't get 68. With the first class, the minimum yeah. you need is 75 in each subject. Like, you can't get below that. So I had that at the back of my head right. that I have to get a 75 minimum. And, and yes. I had time on my wall throughout my career. I had <clears throat> What do I need for first semester, second year? What do I need for first semester, second semester? So every semester I had a target. Wait, and my target, wait, yeah. wait, 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 Brenda. <laughs> Hold on a minute. You had what? 
I had targets. I had targets. I had academic targets pinned to my wall in my on bedroom. On your wall? Yes. In your bedroom, you had targets that I must get set on the wall. Written yes, out. I had in each in each I had a target for each subject, and I had a target GPA. And I'm proud that I met each and every target. And actually, in my fourth year, I went over and above. Wow. Yes, and so I find. So let me let me let me yeah. let me just say this to people who are listening. People, priorities, priorities, priorities. Write them down. Yeah. Write put them on your wall. Visualize. You you I overachieve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so oh I, eventually first so i finally got the first class um in my fourth year mister and then now the battle to maintain it began so oh my gosh second wow. semester for fourth of my fourth year i didn't sleep i had to make sure that i did not get anything that would jeopardize that 4.4 cgpa and thank god it didn't wow. like I, I passed yeah it's so so that's how i got the first class it was really just focus and, and deciding this is what i want and, and i knew exactly what i needed to do to get it and and i did and we thank god for that so so uh, when was it is it two years ago or something you were recognized yeah. you got a recognition so yes. what was that so, it, so actually that mm. particular recognition started in 2014 from it's a peer review called chambers global um, where they go and ask clients and, and your peers sort of what your work is like and, and what not. Actually, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think, I think they sort of ask about you to your peers or when they go and do the peer reviews mm -hmm. for the clients and just ask them, how was this lawyer on your transaction? So when I left Uganda in 2013, I got my first mm -hmm. recognition in, in 2014 for work that I'd been doing in Uganda. And that recognition... Now, first, 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 first pause there. I think yeah. I may have jumped ahead of myself with that I question. I think so. <laughs> but let's come back. So you go to, you get your first class degree in yes. Makerede. Yes. Weren't you the first woman to get a first class degree? No, I was the law, second after, I was the second after Sandra Kiapi. She's really one of the people I really ah, yeah, yeah. Yes. to. Yes. yes, 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 yes. And her dad was my teacher. He was, okay. he was, uh, he, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the, his teacher's administrative law. Let's get to LDC. How yeah. was that for you? LDC was interesting because, so for all of university, I stayed at home. Uh, and then LDC, mm -hmm. my parents kicked me out. They're like, yeah, sorry, you need to go and be with people. <laughs> you need to move on. Mm, yeah, you need yeah, to go and be around people. people. And and my dad, because he'd done LDC quite late in, 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 in life, he'd said, you know, this course, mm. you can't do it on your own. You actually need to, to be around people. Of course, it's very practical. And um, I had a yeah, discussion. And it's very, tough, eh? it's very, yes. very tough. It's a it's a very tough course. Yes. And um, I had yes. a, a discussion group that I'd moved with literally from first year of my career. So we just continued mm. discussing. And, and uh, it was interesting for me because I don't think I really had a voice at my career. I was a backbencher. I used to sit at the back and just... I don't, I don't even know the word to use. I just, you know, go through <laughs> class. But I wasn't, I wasn't a girl who would be you in are, front of you, the class. You, 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 are, you are in Kamoli. Properly. Very much in Kamoli. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so LDC was different because... So you, LDC, you had to speak out. You, yeah, you had to, to participate. Moot, there like were moods. There were all sorts of things. And, and the classes were smaller. Yes. But sorry, our class was so big. I think we were like, I don't know, 150 in the day class. Were so many you mm -hmm. could. I mean, even if you wanted to speak, <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> so, were you in the same class with, with Moses Ali? No, okay, all right, yeah, go, go on. Yeah, so LDC was interesting, and um, um, I, I actually did well there as well. I ended up second over, okay, uh, and I got oh wow, yes. So and, and that comes from you know dedicated again hard work, yeah, working with and also and teamwork like really because we were such a group mm -hmm. of people and we all mm -hmm. studied together and we all worked together and, and I, I and we did well you know so it was nice to 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 pass and that particular year I remember we were very I think we were forty or fifty I can't remember but the mm -hmm. number was quite low so you know it was nice mm -hmm. to to go through it and and you know excel again and for me it was really vindication because at Makere there was this overlying hanging thing of oh and Tambrich's daughter and Tambrich's daughter, which I thought was absurd. Mm. But then at, mm. we never mm. used our surnames, we never used anything, you know, we just wrote numbers on the script. Mm. So there was no Tambrich never yes. and actually at that point I think his university was was involved in legal issues with LDC. 
So, so there was no temperature at LDC. I liked that, that I was really my own person and just did my thing. Uh, and nobody could take okay. that from me. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 how do you end up how do you end up at oxford so oxford um when i was in my long holiday right between uh fourth year and ldc um i started applying to universities and this was really on the advice of my parents still uh my mm. mom sat me mm. down and she told me brenda i did my master's degree with two mm. kids and i'm telling you you cannot like it's going to be too much if you're, you're going to have a family before you get your your qualifications so she said you need to you really mm. need to think about doing postgraduate immediately i was like okay so mm. at that time she used to work in swaziland so she'd say, you know, come pick me up. I'd, I'd drop her in the morning and then she'd say, come, and, come at 4.30 on the dot. By that time, people have left the office. Come and use the computers and do research and decide which courses you want to do, where you want to go to school. So I narrowed down on, on so, four schools. So at that point, at, at that point you were with her in, in, in Mbabani, Yes, right? I used to go, we used to go every holiday to Mbabani uh, while she was in school. Okay. So, okay. yeah, so, so I sat there and, and, and decided uh, on Oxford. I really, you know, between, I remember actually the only reason I didn't apply to Cambridge was that was the application form was so long. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, got you couldn't be born. <laughs> so I applied okay, to Oxford on. and um, I applied to Harvard, I applied to Edinburgh and I applied to Yale. And um, I sent in my stuff long, you know, I think way, in, way ahead of the deadline. And then when we started LDC, yes. first admission I got was Edinburgh. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. And then mm -hmm. I was sitting there. Yeah. And then I think a week after I got Oxford mm -hmm. and it was really unbelievable okay. because I really did not know mm -hmm. anybody young who had been to Oxford. So for me, it was really, really exciting. I was like, this is nice. I'm going to be yeah. the unique one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then <laughs> I got the one for Harvard shortly after. Um, but okay. what, what really was the determinant for, and I did not get into Yale. But the reason I chose yes. Oxford was uh, over Harvard was, first of all, the fees for the American school, it was ridiculously high. And Oxford, yeah, yes, crazy. yes, and Oxford over Edinburgh, I mean, Oxford is Oxford, so it was really a no brainer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oxford is Oxford. Yeah. It's, and it's not, yeah. So when I got the admission, uh, one of the things it was conditional on proving that you had the financial ability to pay. I applied for all yes. sorts of scholarships under the sun. I didn't get a single one. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was actually very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I had a date, mm -hmm. I think maybe May or something, confirm whether or not I'd be going. So I just told my parents, you know what, I failed yeah. to get the scholarship. It's fine. Let me defer for a year and look for, for money. So I think they went and discussed amongst mm -hmm. themselves and they came back and they said, you know what, it, it won't make a difference. I mean, mm -hmm. you might not get the scholarship next year. Instead of wasting this year, why don't mm -hmm. you just go? We'll look for the money, you know. So okay. they sacrificed yeah. all, all manner of things, you know, mm -hmm. to pay for that very expensive mm -hmm. degree. And I'm really grateful. Yeah, because these are these were these were sal these were salary exactly. people just doing an honest day's job. Exactly. Do you know? So it was must have been a massive sacrifice on them. Yes, part. and all three of us, like my brother was already in school in the UK. Uh, my sister was doing her master's degree in South Africa, and then you, then I, <laughs> you know, it was a lot. And it was really mm -hmm. a financial crunch time for, for, for my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and really, mm -hmm. that's why I say, when I say that I owe everything to them, this is the reason why they really put down everything to make sure that we got the best education. So you then go off to Oxford. Yeah. That was fun. I, I loved Oxford. No, okay, I loved Oxford. I didn't like the UK, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the uni experience. I loved living alone abroad, you know. It was different. <clears throat> um, the only mm -hmm. thing was a, it was a bit of a culture shock because in terms of the way they taught. So Macari, yes. yeah, Macari was more the guy would come and stand in or the lady at the front of the class and talk. And maybe you'd be taking mm -hmm. notes. And with Oxford, it was mm -hmm. very different. It was very interactive. The classes were very small. Mm -hmm. um, they knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And it didn't help that we were only four black people in the entire class. So they knew all the black people. Mm -hmm. There was no Kamori in Oxford. You had to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then also it was very intensive. So, so you know, in the, in, the, in the admission stuff, they'd say you need to do 45, 45 hours of reading every week. And I was like, yeah, right. What? Yeah, I thought it was a joke. But you actually had to do a proper nine to five day of studying because the materials were really so many to get through 
Um, mm-hmm. So that was my Oxford experience. And, and I made very amazing friends. We've been friends mm-hmm. since then. I mean, it's been 14, 15 years and we still talk every week. You know, it's been amazing. Mm-hmm. The girls who are my, my housemates, we, we've maintained a friendship since then. So for me, in terms of networking, it was amazing. A lot of the people I was in class mm-hmm. with are in all these nice big magic circle farms. Oh, we're in these magic circle farms for a while. Uh, and and um, they're all over the world. So it was a great networking opportunity yeah. for me. Yeah. So, so you finish Oxford. Yes. And then what? I come back. I, so as I said, I didn't like the UK at all. And mm-hmm. I finished my exam. I even remember. I finished my exams on the 11th of July. And on the 11th of July, I was in Kampala. <laughs> and wow. Yeah, I was just no, like, I'm not, I'm no not having around. it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, okay, so maybe I mm. something I didn't mention was while I was at LDC, I did my clerkship with Kampala Associated Advocates. And they promised me okay. a job. But it was not anywhere in writing. Mm. So I knew mm-hmm. I had this job, but nobody was quite confirming that I had the job. So yes. So while I so I kept writing, I wrote so many emails. Um, I wrote to the, so my very first supervisor was, was David Mpanga, who is now at Dentons. Uh, so yes. I think I can't remember actually who I first wrote. I wrote to so many people, and then eventually I wrote to him, and he's like, "Why are you even asking? <laughs> of course you're coming back." <laughs> and uh, so that was it. But I remember in between, I had written to a couple of other law firms, and a lot of them were like, "I got a, I got outright noise from some of them," and then others were like, yes. "Let's let's talk. We'll see, you know." But then uh, yeah, that's how I ended up back at KA, and that was my very first job in law. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was quite an experience. I really gained so much. David Mpanga as a mm. boss was amazing. He, he like, mm. for someone like me who was so green, you know, he really mm. took me under his wing. Uh, he taught me so many things. He was my, he was the first, any sort of like financing I did was under David Mpanga. And I, I also worked, I yes. And I also worked, we worked close, he worked closely with Aisha Naiga. So Aisha Naiga was also mm-hmm. someone who had quite an impact on my career in terms of mm-hmm. teaching me how to pay attention to detail. So my first experience with mm-hmm. collateral, like mortgages for banks and whatnot, was under Aisha Naiga. So in terms of impact, first one impact, I would say David and Aisha played such a big, big role in my, in my, in my career. And um, so, hmm. no, you are finishing. You finish. Yeah, and then after that, uh, I I was at KA from two thousand eight to two thousand ten, and then uh, two thousand ten, I moved to seventy one. That's what. Oh, okay. Yes, and uh, we were talking about that recognition. When where does it come in? At this is place? after I've left. Like I'm already in Kuwait. That's when that recognition came in. Ah, okay. So let's first go back to seventy one. Yeah. Sebalo Anule was amazing. Um, I worked with, I worked very closely with Barnabas from Sinjize and with, mm. I, I worked with all of them, but Barnabas from Sinjize and Nicholas Echimo were the ones I worked with the most. And it was amazing. It really, yes. I feel like that's where my... Very fine, very, very fine mind. Absolutely. And that's where I learned, I grew as a lawyer. Uh, uh-huh. They had, they mm. had a way that just let you, you know, run with transactions, give you so much responsibility. Mm. And and I, I learned so much from them. And I'm actually still very much in touch with Barnabas. I think like two summers ago we're in, in the same country at the same time and we met up and laughed for literally two hours while catching up. <laughs> so, you know, it was really nice. He's always, you know, wanting to know what's happening, how's your career going and, and all that. So yeah. that was one place that I yeah. felt my deal sheet grew in terms of sort of the transactional work that I was doing. Uh, I did so yeah. much at Sevalu. Uh, it was really, yeah, a great, great platform for me. So you were there till when? until 2013. So how do you end up in? <laughs> ah, the <this> story. <laughs> so yes. wait, wait, wait. So in 2013, I think I sort of so started feeling a bit restless, and um, I really wanted to move abroad now, and just decided like you know it would be nice if I worked abroad, but I had no links or anything to anyone. So I passed on my CV to a couple of contacts, and I just told them, oh, if you have anything, let me know, kind of. So one random day, um, uh, a contact of mine just says, oh, by the way, someone is asking for your CV. Can I pass it on for a law firm? I was like, law firm where? Kuwait. I was like, ah, okay. So um, they pass on the CV. And then I think a couple of days after that, I get a call from my now boss, who happened to be a former professor uh, at uh, at Makere. 
So we met mm. and he told me so much about Kuwait, he told me about the law firm, uh, told me, uh, you know, basically what I'd be doing. Uh, and really, I, I, to me, it just seemed like so unreal. I was like, what if the people actually do this sort of work? <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, he said, you know, if you're interested, you know, just put in your application, have a look at our website. And if you're interested, um, um, just apply through the website. And when you put in your application, yeah. you know. so I did exactly that. I, think okay. I, went, I went onto the website and it was amazing. Of course, when I had Kuwait, mm -hmm. my impression of Kuwait was mm -hmm. what Hollywood shows us of, of the Arab world. Yes. So obviously I was shocked yes. when I was being showed pictures and, and it was a completely different place. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Mm. I could actually live here. So anyway, I went, did a bit of research in the law firm. And that very night, I put in my application. A few weeks after, mm -hmm. did my interviews, which mm. passed. And uh, mm -hmm. when I got the job, my boss tells me, oh, by the way, you need to call Sim Katende and thank him. <laughs> so wow. the first the reason I'm in Kuwait is because of a man called Sim. <laughs> I don't Sim, our Sim. Yes. Sim. I don't know. I mean, I've never told this story, but um, that's how. Yes. Yeah, the reason I'm in Kuwait. So how does <laughs> so how does Sim connect? Sim is very good <laughs> friends with my boss. Uh, um, so yes. he really. That, that's uh, that's yes. Um, I'm not supposed to. I, I know he's very private, so I don't want to talk too much about him. <laughs> you you greet him. You, you tell him come. Shenga said. Hi. I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> so I'm sure he's at your. <laughs> But yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, Simo is very instrumental in me moving to Kuwait. And as they say, the rest is history. That's how I ended up here. So you've been there for how long? This is my eighth year. I'm starting my ninth in January. Wow. So so the other recognition we were talking about. Now yes. let's go back to that. So, so you, you've, 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 you've had quite a few uh, in recognitions for your work. Right. Um, so mm. when I moved to Kuwait, I think the year before, like the past, the, the, the years leading up to my move, I'd been doing really incredible work at Sebalu and Lule. And as I said, Barnabas mm. was really good at like just letting you flow with the deal and, and you know, just taking a lot of responsibility. So I, I imagine mm. when, when, when they did the client feedback for Chambers Global, um, my name must have come up. And that's how I got recognized. And actually, at that point, it was Associate to Watch. I was recognized as an Associate to Watch. Um, and that's really, yeah, Associate to Watch for, for Partnership Track, I guess. And when, yeah. I, when I wrote to them and said, oh, I've moved from Sevalu and could you please mail my, my placard to, to, to Kuwait? Then they updated their rankings mm -hmm. to uh, me as an expert based abroad for, for Uganda. So I had that recognition wow. every year for six years. And it was really amazing that you know, all those years, even for the years that I really was, wasn't quite doing work in Uganda, that I actually you know, got that recognition. I have the placard, some in my office, some in my house. Uh, it's really just nice you know, to get that sort of peer validation. So, so it's the Grammys of uh, the legal profession? I would I say so, because not everybody gets them. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody gets them. Yeah. yeah. It's award with award winning. Stuff. So I want to, I want to ask you, um, when you look mm. back at all of these accomplishments, your journey, you know, the academics, you know, you've talked about how these targets on the wall. Uh, every time you have tried, you've just put your mind to it. You've been able to. When, when what are the things? What are the principles that have worked for you that you can say these are the things that have led me to where I am today? I mean, they're quite a number, and, and obviously you've pointed to, to one, which is really goal orientation and focus. I've always been a very focused person. When I put my mind to something, I'll, I'll more, more often than not achieve, achieve that. Um, for me, it's been about my career, and really that's, um, aside from my family, really the most important thing to me. And there are yeah. things that I've learned over the years that have helped, that help, that have helped me over the years and that have also helped me here in Kuwait as I practice law in this jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the first one, obviously, yes. you have to be ethical at all points. You have to be a straight-up lawyer and person. This whole crooked business, mm -hmm. glory-seeking, and all the stuff that, you know, that comes along with being a crooked lawyer, you know, is something that should be cut out. And you, you'll get mm -hmm. to where you need to be being a stand-up person. And, and that, that has been mm -hmm. one of the things that I've always moved with is ethics. And... The other thing maybe I'd say is like also just remaining teachable. 
the one thing I learned very mm. early on is that the first class degree that I got at Macquarie and my ma- and my master's degree from Oxford, all they did was open the doors for me. But it didn't mean that I know yes. everything by virtue of my academic achievements. I obviously don't. So I think one of the things that has helped mm. me along the way is, is just remaining teachable, uh, listening to instruction. Mm. I, I really like to learn, so I'm always open to being taught new things. And that's something I always encourage, mm. you know, people to do. Another thing is is on 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 uh, feedback and, and criticism. You know, us as lawyers, we love we we think we know it all, <laughs> but oh yeah, yes. Oh, oh yes, you're telling me. We... <laughs> but the one thing is, you have yes. to be able to take feedback, positive, negative. You know, take it in good stride and and use it whichever way you choose to, and move, move on. on. But you have to take it. Like you don't know everything. And there's someone out there, you know, who will know better than you. And if they're telling you that, you know, you're doing this this way, but maybe you should consider doing it that way, they, they probably know what they're talking about. So it, it doesn't hurt you to, like, listen to, to what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And then what... I mean, you can always refuse. Absolutely, you can refuse, and, but at least listen, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. And, yeah. So, now I was going to say, one of the things that you've done quite yeah. well is you have built over and above your professional career you've built quite a personality uh on social yeah. media and you, you have friends you have everybody engages with you i have never found in the last how many years we've engaged i've never seen anybody commit violence because they, they can't try me <laughs> <laughs> i'll also be violent <laughs> i'm joking but <laughs> No, but but so 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 what what has drawn mm. you into the into this world and how have you found it and how useful has it been to you in your other life? Yeah, for me, I think I realized very early on, and to be honest, in past positions, I really got into trouble for social media, which I really didn't understand because for mm-hmm. me, I look at social media as a medium of communication and also as a medium of of learning. And and it's also a way you can um, expose yourself, you can brand yourself whichever way you want to on social media. I've always used uh, social media as a tool. I'm, I'm always keen to see, you know, what's going on around me. And it's interesting to see that mm-hmm. even the people who were once berating me for having a Twitter are now on Twitter, you know. So uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's one of those things. But obviously, as I always, I, I like to say to lawyers who are using Twitter, is you have to obviously be very careful uh, in terms of what you're, you're tweeting, especially about work. I don't tweet about work at all mm-hmm. because of confidentiality obligations. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you'll never find a tweet mm-hmm. from me about a transaction I'm working on because I would never do that. So, you know, there are limits to how you use the social media. Um, I like to engage, mm-hmm. but then it's also to an extent. It's not, you know, free for all. I'm not going to spill all my stuff on social media. Um, but yes, I just like it as a branding tool and also maybe as a thought leadership tool. Yeah. It's very interesting to interact with people from all walks of life. And that's why I'm on these platforms. My, my family really teases me. They call me their influencer. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, I, I agree with them. I, you're, you're, yes, yeah. yes, you've done you've done well on that front. So you, if the law fails, you can always come and be an influencer. You'll you'll still make money. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 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 one of the your areas of interest mm. is um, being a role model or at least modeling the kind of either behavior or outcomes for young women, particularly in the law field. Do you want to talk about your experiences? I mean, okay, I'll do what I did uh, yesterday, is to say, you talk to me as a father of an 18-year-old girl. What would you tell me? Um, I'd I'd tell you to, to, to obviously let your, let your daughter see, see out her dream. Um, you know, you know this prof- this this profession, particularly for law, is very challenging for women. And in my experience, the microaggressions, the microaggressions that come along with being female, you know, there are prof- there's so many. Yes. But um, I've learned over the years that 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 it's it's really small stuff. I I really do not let it get to me. I think it's it's taken a while, but I've gotten to that point where there are times I've gotten into meetings and people assume I'm the secretary. But by the end of the meeting, <laughs> by the end of it, no, I'm not yeah. the secretary. You are, you, are, <laughs> so, you, you are the chairman. <laughs> maybe not the chairman, maybe the vice chairman, but you know what I mean? Like it's, uh, it's yes, yeah. you have to, you have to encourage, I, I think girls need to be encouraged um, 
to 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 pursue this profession irrespective of whether it's it seems daunting um you you know i i i, I had tweeted earlier a few things that i'd learned as a woman in this profession and, and what girls should take you need to obviously find a mentor share share them with us you know because there will be people here who may not have found the time to go back and read okay. so maybe you want to just break them down for us what are those okay so this would even actually just apply to everyone not necessarily women but obviously if women listen more you know power to them um mm. you, you have to value teamwork and it's something that I've, I've i've learned along the way that you're not an island uh behind you and besides mm. you there are people who are doing incredible things and it's it's only important to learn how to mesh within a team and the mm. other thing is also to just be patient with yourself uh, as a woman, you know, you'll mm. see your male counterparts being promoted over you. <laughs> you'll see all sorts of things. Mm. But at the end of the day, you know, you will get there. You just have to be patient with yourself and sort of focus on your goals, focus on what's brought you into a job. Mm. What's your financial goal? Are you planning? Do you want to hit a certain financial goal before you leave a job? Maybe, you know, do that. Or do you want to reach a certain position in a company before you leave? You know, just focus on that without paying too much mind to the microaggressions of being, you know, the microaggressions you'll face. And then the other thing mm -hmm. is, I'd also say is always find a mentor. It's nice to have a, a female mm -hmm. mentor, but if you can't find a female mentor, find a male one. I have very, I have on both spectrums and I think they're all excellent. So it's, it's something that I, I always encourage younger people is, you know, you need to find a mentor, someone who, if you're down in the dumps and you need to talk to, you know, you can pick up the phone and call them. Uh, or if you just need advice on anything, you should be able to have someone with a little more experience than you who you can speak to. And then, mm, obviously, mm, I, I mean, I've spoken about, mm. about the ethics and the teaching. And then the other thing I'd also say to women mm. is you should be confident, and not only women, but generally, I think you should be confident, but not arrogant. You don't need to be arrogant mm -hmm. to make a great mm -hmm. lawyer. You know, you can be confident mm. and put your points across without you being overly, overly, over. Mm. <laughs> you don't need to be arrogant to be a great Cause. lawyer, but... Cocky. Yes, you don't need to be cocky. You just need to be confident. And the other thing mm. I'd say is also mm. embrace change. If you have opportunities that come your way and they seem like they're, they, they're you know, mind-blowing, just like I had an opportunity to come to Kuwait that was amazing that I couldn't have, go for mm. it. Mm. You know, don't be held down by, by what society will say or what will so-and-so say, oh, my gosh, I'm moving. Always, oh, where am I going to end? Like, take the jump, you know? Make 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 the decision, take the jump. I, I guess for me it was a bit easier because my circumstances are quite simplified. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, but, you know, like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then also the other thing maybe I'd say is also embrace the lows when they're there because you'll have good days and you'll also have bad days, but embrace the low days and learn from them. And when you have bad days, also yeah. embrace those and, you know, learn from those as well and celebrate them. And the other thing... I was I was on, on as during the day someone was saying something about imposter syndrome that us women have. And yes, mm -hmm. it's it's a big What is imposter syndrome? You just feel like you don't belong or or you feel like you're not qualified to be in a position that you're in. And yeah. It's yeah. so prevalent with women. But the one thing I need to say out loud is women, you need to celebrate your successes. You need to be confident in the value that you're bringing to a team and you need to be confident mm -hmm. in what your contribution is. If you're confident in all but, that, but, but Brenda, mm. somebody, somebody listening mm. to you listing those things that you need mm. to be will say, "Well, it's also well if you come from a privileged background and you've never faced yeah. adversity." Yeah. But if you've faced some of the adversity that people face, so, 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 what would you, in terms of practical mm. ways, uh, tell people? Because, like now we're all faced with a lot of adversity yeah. right now because of the consequences of the pandemic and very many people have found themselves in in a very bad yeah. place. And it's it's easy to say those things, but how do you overcome the circumstances you're in to achieve the state of the things that you're talking about? You know, and, and I know it sounds like really out there, but for me, it's really positive thinking. And personally, mm. I'm a born again Christian and I'm so anchored faith. So mm. when I'm down, I'll pray. Mm -hmm you know, mm. or I'll put on mm. my gospel music and it will lift me up. But that, that... So what you're basically yes. saying, if I understand yes. you well, is that you, as an individual, you owe it to yourself to have coping mechanisms and your own systems of either motivation or discipline that keep you going, even when you're faced with those circumstances. Yeah. Like how you wrote on your yeah. wall, huh? 75 percent yeah absolutely you know it's it's very important you have to you have to find a way to cope 
And that's why I'm saying if you have somebody you can call, you know, and speak to when you're low and say, like, you know, this is what I'm going through. I want to quit tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and the person will talk you out of it. Because honestly, I've also had moments where, where you know, I'm, 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 I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, maybe I should go home tomorrow. I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm tired. But then I always mm. have someone sit mm. me down and say, look at the picture. What's the bigger picture? What's the focus? What do you want out of what you're yeah. doing right now? And I think if you always go back to, exactly. yes, as Natasha said yesterday, if you always go back to your why, you'll find a way. Mm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So this is when um, I get to open up uh, and allow uh, meat roasters, potato growers to, to also talk to you. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Don't Robert, <laughs> the hateration is just crazy. Hey, Brenda, my sister, you're such an amazing. I mean, you really, you really level up and show Robert he's a small boy, huh? <laughs> Robert. So, 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 so Tony thinks has gotten back to me. Don't worry, I always have the last one. So. <laughs> no, but Robert, Brenda yes. is an amazing, an amazing lady. I mean, Brenda. I mean, I mean, I, I, I know the family. I know the brother and the sister, but. They just show, you know, a whole persistence and the grit and amazingness. And Brenda, it's amazing. It's amazing the stories that you, you know, I mean, your life journey and all of that. Brenda, yeah. there's so many girls on this, uh, 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 or so many ladies on this uh, at, at space who really want to know something. And mm. I believe it is something that might be very key for many, uh, probably the guys out there. Mm -hmm. You've succeeded academically. Amazing stuff. But there's also a huge... Um, 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 area of networking that comes into your success. You speak about the amazing names. I mean, from an early stage, people like David Mpanga, Nicholas yeah. Jung, and all these guys. Yeah. How do you network? And how have you found networking to be valuable in whatever you're doing to advance your career and your growth? Because I do believe that has played a huge role yeah. in whatever you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think for me, um, while I was in Uganda, um, if I had lawyers on the opposite end of the transaction, I really tried to get to know them as well. And for that reason, you know, um, people like Philip Karugaba, um, people like Daoud Mpanga of uh, Bowman's, that's how we sort of became friends, is just because I really went out of my way to, to speak to these older lawyers who I admired and, and you know, just wanted to learn from. Um, networking is very important. I, I'd say to the ladies, uh, don't don't feel shy to reach out to people. Uh, half the time, they really want to also mentor. They really want to talk to you. They want to encourage you. So I'd, I'd really, really, you know, encourage women to to reach out to people. You know, I uh, I just want to say this, uh, Brenda. Yeah. Normally, I do it to the yeah. end. But I'm going to do this in the middle because, you know, we've got so many people logged on mm -hmm. now that I want to tell them who I will be talking to tomorrow yeah. because her story is just absolutely fascinating. And she's so young and has almost lived like three lives in. So she's called Denise Kechimuli. And she runs an organization called The Vessel in Me, something to do with children. But the story of her trying to get a child and the, the things that she's had to go through are incredible. So tomorrow, guys, uh, it's a good way to wind up the week because it's a story that ends very well. So, yeah. Brenda, let me bring in somebody called Animo Afiei. Um, Animo. Thank you so much, Robert. Hi, Brenda. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Those of us that know you personally are very proud of you. Um, I, I had, I had two, two questions to ask. One is, um, did you ever feel the, the pressures of being, you know, like the only, the first one to, to get a first class or the first one or the first this? You understand what I mean? Yeah. And then how did you, um, how did you manage the balance between, because obviously you were very young when you achieved all these very many things. Um, and, and that sort of might have sort of created a gap between you and your peers. So how did you manage to, to keep the balance, like not um, keeping yourself away from people who are you were in the same class with, but obviously have achieved so much more than them? And then secondly, um, okay. I want to build, um, I don't know if it's possible to ask that second question. I just want to believe that um, yeah. Kuwait was your first country um, in the Islamic world, in the Arab world, um, and a relatively, you know, a more patriarchal society than, than maybe what we are used to in, in the African continent and in East Africa. Um, so, difficult to adjust to that type of life. What? How did you 
maneuver. Um, I know that sometimes maybe you have to go into a meeting and maybe with an emir or people that you, you cannot show your face, you have to veil up. And this is not something that you're used to as someone who is not a Muslim. So how did you manage to navigate around these type of things that sort of um, were targeting your your um, confidence and, and, and spirit? How did you manage to navigate around that? Thank you so much. Brenda, you answer that. Okay. So on the first one, as to whether I have had pressure being the first of this and the first of that, I'll say absolutely not because I'm just focused on my own journey and on my I, I stay in my lane. So I try not to look sideways and, and I'd also encourage everybody else not to like just do you and uh, focus on yourself. And um, on keeping the balance with peers in my class, I believe a lot of people who I went to school with are very, very successful. A lot of them are partners in law firms. Um, my, 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 my friend group, my very close friend group is actually not lawyers. Um, but I, I, I don't necessarily distance myself. It's just maybe I wasn't quite close to, to lawyers in my, in my class. Um, on Kuwait being patriarchal, yes. Um, that's, I mean, this is, the, this is the reality of the Arab world. However, I think um, it's, it's a bit shielded for me because the, the, sorry, the, the law firm I work for is, a bit, is very diverse and we have people from all over the place. It used to be a bit strange for me going into meetings and, you know, you just know you can't stretch out your hand to certain people. Like if someone is, you know, all in Arab garb, you, you, you have to be careful about how you're addressing them and whatnot. But then um, I haven't found it challenging. Maybe it was interesting initially. Then you adapt as time goes by. Right. I've got Henriette Paula Mugisa. Paula. Thank you, Mr. Kavushenga. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you for your time. Um, Brenda, like Animo, I have two questions. Um, I wanted you mm -hmm. to speak a little bit on the microaggressions that you mentioned your experience as a woman and probably many other women on this call that are powerful, that are sitting on certain tables experience. So I wanted you to speak a little bit about that and the practical ways that you deal with those. And related to that question, um, I also wanted to know if sitting on these tables as a woman, very powerful, very accomplished as you've been, you've been in instances where by the nature of being a woman, as part of the deal or the project, you end up getting the short end of the stick. Um, I was wondering if you've experienced anything like that or know anybody who has and how you propose for other women to deal um, with those. I think women doing business, women who are professional, the reason I ask these questions is because often we have to be twice as better yeah. um, than the men sitting on the same tables with even more qualifications, with even more experience. Um, and then we also have to be wary of the other things, not seeming emotional, not seeming too proud, not seeming not knowledgeable enough. So I was wondering how you've managed all of that so far. Thank you. Thank you. So, Brenda. Yeah, on on up. the microaggressions, I think for me, the most common one has been the secretary one, people <laughs> assuming I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, I think also sometimes just the general assumption if you're in a meeting and people, I mean, they'll first do a double take because you're the female and they think maybe you don't know what you're saying, but you actually do. Um, how I've dealt with those is really let my work speak for itself. Um, I've, uh, when I get into a meeting or anything like that, I'm, I I try to be very confident so that, you know, you put the person at ease so that they know that you know what you're doing. And more often than not, it, it really, it works. Uh, on, the, on getting the short end of the stick, I must say that I've been very fortunate to work with very awesome people. Um, at KA, as I mentioned, David Mpanga, who is now at Dentons, was, was good, very good at, at letting you fly. Same with Barnabas Tumsinjize and also with my current boss right now. Um, I don't get the short end of the stick. I actually feel like I do so much, a lot of the back, you know, a lot of the groundwork and it's just fortunate. And maybe what I would say to the men on the call is that, you know, you really should avoid doing this, you know, giving, trying to get women to do the work that's lesser than and just give them a chance to, to put themselves out there. I don't think for even one day that I would be in the position I am in right now if it wasn't for the amazing uh, male people who, who gave me, you know, the opportunity. Right, let's hear from Isaac N. Mpanga. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I, I, I am a great admirer of she knows that through our inbox. But uh, I need to. And, ask... and I would have been surprised 
something that you didn't ask about. <laughs> no, no, I had to ask Brenda one because just like me, Brenda is an underdog. You go to Oxford from yes. Kampala and you don't have any relative in Oxford. You make it. <laughs> now, my experience is a bit strange. I I went to a village university. You know, when we, I went to Nkumba, but when I go to LDC, I was told I didn't actually go to Nkumba. I'm lying. I went to UPU because they thought her father's university was even below mine. And that I must have gone to that one. So <laughs> I was at a lot of village at LDC. Uh, but yes. at LDC, uh, against all odds, my naysayers who came from Makere and they felt very prestigious, remained there completing a few mm. issues and joined me later on the graduation. <laughs> now, I, I, have, I have over time seen Brenda pushing these boundaries. Uh, go to Oxford, come back. You have had a profile. She has not worked for what you don't call a top-notch law firm. She went to very good schools, got very good grades. I, I, the checklist she speaks about, I do have it. I got a second upper, and mm. I, 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 I had been given the trick to get a D1 in each semester. So I have eight D1s you'll be assured of a, of, a, of, a, of a first class. I have had all these checklists. But how do you make it brighter to that extent? You get the checklist, you check everything, you pass you, you pass from a very humble university, you go to LDC, you still excel, you come out, you get a nice job. But how do you make that diamond shine? How do you be a brander? That's what I need to hear explained. The, 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 the things you're explaining are good. And they are, they, 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 they are nice. But we've done them. And we are not branders. You are, you are Isaac. Yeah, no, no, no. We, 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 want, we want to be to be rated. We want to be award-winning lawyers. And not that we've not won, won any judgments. How do you make the spotlight shine on that which you truly are? Brenda, answer that. Ooh, that's, that's actually an interesting question. I think I need to ask my employers how I got into their law firms because... <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but the point... But I, I, I understand Brenda, the, point the point he's making. And... And I think it, yes, how to be yeah. how to be Brenda? How can anyone be Brenda? Eh, you know that's a really hard one. Um, I think for me, honestly, I'm, what I think has worked for me is a match of my personality uh, yes. plus my work, and um, the fact that I'm, I'm 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 I just very easily mesh into things and and uh, I adapt very easily, and it's that ease of adaptation mm -hmm. that has actually helped me. Um, get into you know the, the positions that I've been and I, I think maybe the other thing I'd mention is that I, I always try and go the extra mile to improve myself outside of the outside of the academic qualification but I'm always trying to improve myself in other ways so and I always try and highlight that so yeah and I'm always also asking for work like I like to work so I will if I want to be involved in something I'll usually ask to be involved so I guess that's the best way I can say. I really don't know how to answer that question, apart from saying maybe it might be a match of my personality plus my academic achievements and, and transactional work. Well, 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 I guess me, what I see from where I am, one is you're authentic. Because when we see Brenda, we don't see pretense or anything. There's nothing. What you see is what we get. So that's, I think you're authentic. But you're also very aware and you're and you're not limited you're not you're not your office you are brenda yeah. you will be broadcasting you will be on social media you'll be talking to your friends you will be naughty you'll be running around and then you still do serious yeah. work so you're the all-round personality so that maybe that's what i would that's what i see from this side i don't know if you're aware of that or see that but at least that's what some of us see uh, i mean i'm learning <laughs> Let's see. yeah there you go so let me ask peter ahabwe all right. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Um, and thank you so much, Brenda. I'm a big fan. I have listened to your podcast, Views by Brenda. I have two questions for you. The first question is, I, I don't know if Mr. Robert asked about your, your master's program that you took on at Oxford, but my question is that in your pursuit of your career, did you think that what you were studying at um, Oxford had a bearing or a footprint back at home, like in Uganda, you talked about the fact that you didn't like UK and you quickly got back in Uganda. But what you were studying, did you feel like it had a relevance in your practice? Because I know you love corporate law. And did you feel like what you had studied at Masters had a bearing here and you could practice and take it on? Then my second question is, um, um, in pursuit of your career, you also talked, you told us to be grounded. But is have you felt some bit of ineptness? And how have you dealt with that as as, as a lawyer, 
and also you talked about the fact that you're lean. So how have you laid, have you how have you dealt with that bit of uh, ineptness as you pursue your career, even at a global stage? Yeah. Thank you so much, Robert. Welcome. Brenda, um, take that one. For my master's degree, I um so you know, as you are applying, you're sort of asked what the subject what subjects you want to do. And I chose subjects that I really had a keen interest on that are actually quite relevant to what I'm doing now. So I did insolvency, I did corporate finance, I did global finance, and I did competition law. And these are all things that have been relevant to my practice of law you know, since I left Oxford. So yes, I'd say that what I studied at Oxford is relevant to what I'm doing right now and was relevant to the law I was practicing in Uganda as well. In terms of ineptness, I think the one thing that I learned very on, especially when I moved here to Kuwait, is ask. I've been taught that it, you, there's no shame in asking where you're not sure. Because, you know, that, that you, I think initially I was very keen on, you know, trying to show that I understood what the work, what was required of me without understanding that, you know, there's a difference in the way the law is, there's a difference in the way, the way mm. things are presented in, in the law firm. And, and I, I, was, I really wanted to impress, and yet I was doing myself a disservice until I was sat down and told, you know what, just open the doors, knock on people's doors and ask them. So that's what I do when I'm not sure about something that I'm doing. I will just ask, and thankfully, with, with the law firm I'm at, we have an open door policy. So you literally just walk into anyone's office and ask them what you need to ask them or um, pick up the phone and call them. They'll, and, and I know my boss gets super irritated because I think I call him 30 million times a day asking him <laughs> when I'm not sure. But for what I do when I don't know something is I'll ask someone who, 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 who knows better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've got a question from Andy Njenga. Andy Njenga. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yes. Hi, Andy. Long time. <laughs> now, uh, my, my, my uh, uh, not were you in, were in that nursery yeah. school? Or no? <laughs> 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 she, she talked about a school that was in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on, Andy. Sorry to disturb you guys. Just go carry I actually, on. Andy. I actually don't have a question. I've been with Brenda for close to nine, going 10 yeah. years now. Mm -hmm. uh, first time I've interacted with her. Glad to learn that you were born in Nairobi. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, you're transiting to actually my, my line here because navigation. I was in aviation and uh, I dealt with leases, wet and dry of okay. aircraft. So uh, I will keep praying for you that you excel in that field. Thank you. Uh, congr congratulations. And uh, just keep the faith, keep believing. And all shall turn out well for you. Robert. Yes. Your coffee. Yes. Needs to hit shells here in Nairobi, so do you some time? Uh, immediately after this, we are, we are, we are going to... Yes, I, I like those kinds of people. Yeah. And, and, and our season is beginning now, so don't worry. Immediately after this, immediately I'm sending yeah. you a message, and we see. Focus hey. on getting regional. Thank you, Andy. Don't worry. Uh, Andy, I, yeah. I am coming to you. Don't worry. Yeah. Immediately after this, there, yeah. are, there, is, there, there are still buses that come to Kenya. I'll put yeah. the supply on the bus. Okay, okay, thank, okay. Th thanks, thank Andy. So, thanks, Andy. I appreciate the kind words. So, Brenda, uh, let us sort of begin to uh, wind this yeah. down. Um, when you look back, mm -hmm. um, no, maybe let's not even go too much into the past. Where you are yeah. now, what, because one of the things that comes out of my conversation with you has been the consistency in your clarity about what you want and where you want to go used to be very, very yeah. clear. Um, what does the future look like for you right now? Well, Where would you want to be yeah. in 10 years from now? I mean, I really enjoy what I'm doing now. I enjoy where I'm now. I enjoy the sort of exposure that this you know, job has afforded me. <clears throat> I, I see myself here for a while. You know, I mean, East West home is best. It was, I think, a couple of years ago where... Um, um, when I actually thought maybe I should come back home and I was actually thinking of, of returning. But then I had a sit down with my dad who talked me out of it completely. And uh, I think I'm just comfortable here for now. I haven't thought too much into the future. Um, East West home is best, but for now Kuwait is home. <laughs> That's how I put it. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so what would you say to... Uh, 22, 23, 24-year-old uh, young ladies getting into the career world, into the job world, 
especially some of whom might be looking at wanting to start a family vis-a-vis yeah. -vis building a career vis-a-vis -vis, uh, relationships and so on. Mm -hmm. Those choices tend to be very difficult for a lot of people between 20 and 30. Right. What would you say to them? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say to them to, you know, basically enjoy the seasons they're in. When I came to Kuwait, I was single. I mean, I guess it worked. You know, <laughs> I didn't have much to tie up. <laughs> I just needed to get on a plane yeah. and bring myself over here. And, um, yeah. um, as, as, as Hillary, Hillary keeps saying that if the only choice you have is to jump with both feet. Yeah, both, exactly. There's, there's, there's nothing to wait for. Yes, yes and I'd, I'd, I'd really encourage females, you know, don't think about, will I get married if I go? Will I, you know, because I think everything has its season. There are people who marry late and they're very happy. There are people who marry early and they're unhappy. And why wouldn't you build up your career uh, in, uh, as opposed to, you know, chasing this societal, I call it a, a chokehold, a societal chokehold, because that pressure, you know, to get, I really, I really tell young ladies, you need to free yourself from it. Um, don't rush and kill things like that until you're but, absolutely sure. If you have a great career, if, if you go for if, it. Bre Bre mm -hmm. Brenda, if, if your father's sisters are telling you, no, so you tell them no, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so you, well, yeah. I <laughs> By the way, I have a I have a I have a jumper that my friend Solomon Tumwesije gave me for Christmas a couple of years ago. So every time I'm in Uganda and I'm headed to Uganda yeah. for Christmas, I put it on before they ask me the yeah. thing is printed so that they don't ask me you know that sort of question. <laughs> but I would say I am recommending that to I am recommending it to Sheila and I am going to tell her there is now a standard report. Yeah, it's no fun. Yeah, why are you <laughs> asking question. me when I'm going to marry you? When are you yeah. dying? You know, like, come on. Like, I think society <laughs> needs to free women from this chokehold of marriage and whatnot. Go go, through, go, follow your dreams, you know. The man will come. And actually, I think men these days want women who are accomplished and who are, who are you know, mm, doing mm, their thing. So mm. do your thing. Not one, not, not one with... Not, not one who is going to ask you to send exactly. transport. Exactly. Those transport money things, like free yourself <laughs> from that. Make your own money. Make your own name. Yeah. Be your <clears> own person. And when you find your person, you know, I think it's you're better off having somebody who completes, not completes you, but complements you. Don't don't free yourself mm. from the chokehold of societal pressure is what I would tell every young woman listening. Brenda. Yes. Thank you very much for spending the day Thank with you, us. Robert. This was so much and fun. Above all, I'm so glad it was a public holiday. I would have never managed to do this on a working day. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I threw you in the deep end and left you alone. I went off to do other stuff and left you dealing with it. And by the way, it's going to continue. So, but kindly engage. Yes, people. I'm happy people to answer any questions. questions. People, and my DMs are open. I, I, I recommended a young lady to you. She, she was desperate to speak to you, so I hope you you can, you know, please mentor yeah. people. People are going through struggles. Yes, I do actually right have a Real great uh, cohort of mentors. Mm -hmm. I love the girls I mentor, and I'm always, I'm always looking to mentor people. So if you really are looking for mentors, <clears throat> please reach out to me. My DMs are open. I'd be very happy to. So thank you very much, Brenda, and uh, enjoy Kuwait. Thank you. Uh, have thank fun. You. And I want to remind you guys that tomorrow we have a remarkable young lady called Denise Kechimuri. And I think this week, the young ladies have really, you, you young ladies have just... Girls changed. run the world. Let this is what it is. You are really <laughs> running the world right now, let me tell you, because the conversations you guys have been bringing onto the table have been just something completely different, something totally out of this world, and it's absolutely impressive. So, yes. Brenda, uh, I am proud to, to say that you're one of my really, really good friends, that, you know, keeping your company is one of those things that just makes my my day so thank you so much thank you robert that. and good thank luck you. with all the transactions and the work that you're doing and keep flying the ugandan flag and we know that you're there and you'll make thank you proud. very much have good a good night. night you and everyone else <laughs>